Welcome to Decrypted Unscripted, the Perkins Coie podcast where we examine the privacy landscape from regulatory developments to litigation trends. As always, the views expressed are our own and don't necessarily represent those of the firm. And what we discuss in each episode is not legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship with listeners. Welcome, everyone, to Decrypted Unscripted. My name is Dominique Shelton Leipzig, and I'm here with my partner, David Bitterman. And we have two really amazing guests, Howard Hu and Sina Kyan, to go over blockchain and crypto with us. And I'm going to turn it over to David to say hello to our guest before we get going. Hey, Sina. Hey, Howard. I was telling Sina that I this I know nothing about blockchain. You, I couldn't explain a blockchain if I had to. So you're going to have to speak to me like a like a golden retriever, as they say. So <laughs> we'll go slowly. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Really good to see you. We're so happy to have you. It's great to be here. Well, why don't we kick off? I just This is such a hot topic. Uh, we can't pick up the paper without seeing something about cryptocurrency and blockchain and smart contracts and the volatility going on in the market. So let me just put it to both uh, Sina and Howard. Can you tell us a little bit about, well, first of all, why don't we start from the beginning, um, your background and how you got into this area. And uh, first, before we get into what actually the blockchain and crypto are for right now. My name is Sina and I I uh, actually have a law and finance background. So I went to Stanford Law School and clerked on the D.C. Circuit and the Supreme Court for Chief Justice Roberts. I spent a lot of time thinking through kind of the relationship between rights and remedies. Um, I, I practiced law for a little bit and, you know, continue to, to think through um, how remedies kind of work in, in, in the world. And uh, one of the things that drew me to blockchain and, and specifically the project at Alio is just that it, it provides a technological solution for a lot of the things that I had previously been thinking about as kind of legal problems. So uh, I recently joined Alio um, uh, just last month. Exciting. And do you, can you tell us a little bit about Alio before we move on to Howard? Like, tell us about the company and your VP of strategy. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So Alio is building a layer one protocol in which privacy is a default setting. And uh, just to unpackage that a little bit, the idea here is building a programming language uh, in which people can build out applications on a blockchain um, that have the capacity to protect people's privacy, which is in contrast to the, the earlier blockchain iterations are just completely public. Sina, tell us a little bit about the privacy problem, sort of the legal problem problems you have been thinking about and how you see crypto being able to solve them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, privacy as a right, I think, is fully conceptualized in many ways. I mean, at least since the mid-19th century, you're thinking about Louis Brandeis, you're thinking about everything from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to the Fourth Amendment, their federal laws or state constitutions, their state laws, all trying to protect privacy. I think the missing part is what remedy makes sense. And in the policy world, there's kind of been two answers to that. One is after the fact punishment for things we determine to be violations of privacy. And the, the second has really been more focused on creating some sort of GDPR-like compliance regime in which like compliance teams try to put in place processes that protect privacy. What blockchain allows and what, what Alio is specifically interested in is uh, technology that actually structurally protects privacy. So there's, and the flip side of that is just sort of data security, like allowing minimal leakage of data we don't want the world to see so that uh, bad actors can't take advantage of it. So especially now in this, and let me turn it to Howard uh, now that uh, if I can ask you, especially now as these issues of super sensitive data, our health, our educational data, our work data are, is really been automated and we're, we're so dependent on technology um, as, and that's been sort of supersized in this pandemic. Tell us a little bit, Howard, how you're seeing blockchain right now, and what what is your background and your how did you come to this area? 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, first off, my name is Howard, and uh, I, I first got into the crypto space about 10 years ago, um, and this was through mining at the time. Um, I will admit, um, I was in high school and did not know what I was doing. I, as a kid, I loved computers <laughs> and was really into that. And, uh, you know, around that time, I happened to be uh, running a, a custom PC uh, store on eBay. Um, and because of that, I had a lot of CPUs and GPUs lying around. Um, and uh, as a kid into tech, I would read these tech blogs and, uh, and, and news articles. And I saw one day there was this article about this new internet money that was at 30 cents and it just crashed to 10 cents. And I'm like, what the heck is this? And uh, I looked more into it. And, you know, that's how I actually discovered Bitcoin. And, um, you know, at the time, I really didn't quite understand what was going on. But um, I did the math. And uh, at least for my PG&E bill here in California, my electricity bill in California, um, at 10 cents, it would have been break even effectively. And I said, well, if it goes back to 30 cents, then it's a handsome profit. So um, I said, why not give it a shot? And that's how I actually got into the space. Um, but fast forward a few years, um, during my time in university, it happened to be right when the altcoin boom was happening. So there was new cryptocurrencies like Litecoin or Dogecoin, um, Namecoin, you name it coin, you know, they were all coming out. <laughs> and uh, I got really fascinated by that and wanted to understand what the differences were, what made these new coins uh, unique from Bitcoin. And a lot of it came down to um, the configuration and the properties of it, specifically around consensus and around trust. And I got really fascinated on that, started doing research uh, with professors at Berkeley um, on alternative forms of consensus mechanisms. So new forms of proof of work. We looked at some of the first notions of proof of stake. We also looked at different approaches to consensus using trusted hardware um, and published some papers around that. And uh, after doing that, I ended up actually discovering um, this area of cryptography called zero knowledge proofs, um, which has effectively been the core um, of everything that I've worked on since. Um, it's just a really fascinating uh, piece of technology that I wanted to get a better sense on. I ended up spending about five or six years um, working with uh, a, a few professors at Berkeley, um, also Cornell, um, NYU, Johns Hopkins, um, uh, on effectively building out uh, newer proof systems that were not only more efficient, but also more practical for real world applications. And um, um, to tie in with Alio, about uh, uh, three years ago, we started this project um, called Zexi, which stands for Zero Knowledge Executions. And um, at the time, um, you know, we were evaluating the blockchain landscape. There's really two verticals to look on. The first is effectively um, programmability and the other is on privacy. And we could see that Bitcoin is really low on both. Um, Ethereum extended Bitcoin in one direction to offer high programmability. Um, and there was another cryptocurrency called Zcash, which went the other direction, extending Bitcoin to offer high privacy. Um, but there's this upper right hand quadrant of high programmability and high privacy that was really missing in the market. And, you know, it's not for a lack of trying. People tried. It's just it's really hard to actually strike that balance. And, uh, you know, we said as researchers, could we take a stab at it and do it? And that's how this project even began. Um, after about a about two years of development, uh, we came up with a really good protocol with uh, with an actual implementation and source code. Um, we published the paper, got that accepted into a, a top computer security conference, um, and then also open sourced the, the code. And it was around that time that um, we end, we started commercializing that technology and started Alio. Um, and over the past year and a half, we've been building out the first production implementation of that. Um, and really, the goal is to offer a platform that allows developers, um, especially web developers, to write um, full-fledged applications that offer uh, the full spectrum of privacy that's necessary, giving users full control over their data, over their ownership, um, and also offering applications the ability to attest, uh, to provide compliance or fairness um, about the service that they're giving so that users have a high level of confidence over what it is that they're actually interacting with. So, as, again, like, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Margin Call where uh, Jeremy Irons says, you know, speak to me like I'm a two-year-old or a, a, a golden retriever. That, that's where I am here. So why don't we start, if you don't mind, could you just explain blockchain technology just real quickly and then explain how that relates to crypto and then maybe we talk about the private and then the privacy issues that you guys are addressing because I think that that for at least for users like me or listeners like me, that's where we got to start because I'm, I'm, I'm at the golden retriever stage, my friends. Sure. Um, I think the easiest way to frame it is with respect to why blockchains even came about. Um, if you looked 20 years ago, 
you know, the internet was really just getting off the ground. People were, from from a mainstream perspective, were starting to use it for real world purposes to do business, to do commerce, um, and it was around that time that people started realizing, wait a second. Um, I can transmit my information, I can receive back information, but I have no good way to transfer my money and to receive money. Um, so all sorts of new startups and new protocols and ideas were being developed around the time um, to basically create um, some form of digital cash. Um, there was really um, a lot of cryptographers that were trying to devise a method that could securely allow you to prove your ownership um, and demonstrate that I actually sent you um, you know, five bucks. But the challenge with that is when you're on the web, you don't really know who's sitting behind the other side of the screen. Um, and it's very hard for you, the receiver, to really know that the sender sent you money and didn't double spend that money. And so effectively, um, for about a decade or so, people were trying to come up with new schemes, new methodologies to try to make that attestation great. And on the other front, there was the industry perspective of, you know, companies like PayPal came about, which solved it by basically going the business route of using insurance to pad the to, to pad it and to actually secure against these types of things. Basically, you know, the approach that, that a lot of industry took was to say, these things are going to happen. Let's bake it into the risk model and let's let's try to ensure that the bottom line is protected. Um, and on the other side, there are these cryptographers trying to say, how can we make it such that the incident can't even happen because math says it can't happen. And by doing that, actually give you a strong guarantee that I can, you know, effectively send you money. And so um, about 15 years ago or so, there was um, this kind of breakthrough in, in realization that, wait a second, like, instead of trying to enforce all this replication, what if we started to try to enforce scarcity on the web? And by doing that, um, it actually could allow you to say, only this one person can own this piece of information. And so the way that they actually pursued doing that was to say, for the people who want to participate in this new money system, Everybody has to keep a copy of the ledger. There exists a ledger. It's a book of entries saying, here's an identity and here's an amount. And effectively, if everybody keeps the same tabulation, the same tally as everybody else, then when someone says, I want to send, you know, Alice wants to send Bob $5, um, if everybody records it on their ledger, then everyone will agree that that transaction happened. And the way that you actually enforce that everybody agrees to that is through a form of consensus. And it was around that time that people realized that I could actually devise a puzzle, a mathematical puzzle um, to solve, to prove that I am the person who is currently supposed to be effectively creating a new entry in the ledger and everybody else should replicate my entry. So um, it's almost like a way to, to provide an authority to others to say that I am allowed in this moment to add stuff into the ledger. And the whole point of the system to ensure the consensus is fair is to allow everybody to take turns at adding those entries into this ledger. Um, so that's effectively how this technology really came about. The, the original intention is to enable web payments in a way that's actually, um, you know, usable by, by, by everyone without having these types of, you know, insurance and, and risk uh, type of metrics to have to worry about that I can just send money. Um, and over the years, after this, this small insight became so big, um, people started to realize, well, I could do this not, not just for, for some balance on a ledger, actually, since it's just an arbitrary entry of data, I could do it for anything. And people started realizing I could actually put code in there. And then I can ask people to run that code to do even more things. And, and effectively, as the years went on, people started to discover, I can do a lot of things with this. And, and fundamentally, I think today where we're at, the difference between this solution and what the existing industries payment rails have, have devised is effectively that, you know, if you're PayPal um, and your database engineer at PayPal, think about the number of times you've accidentally added an extra zero into an entry in that database. And you've, and you effectively just minted new us dollars without realizing <laughs> it was, it was purely by accident. Um, you know, in a blockchain system, you can't do that because everybody is keeping a same copy of that database effectively. And, and when you make that erroneous entry, Everyone else will look at it and say, wait a minute, this doesn't look right. I'm not going to add that into my database. And once, you know, 99% of people choose not to enter it, you're clearly excluded from it. And you're going to look around and say, wait a second, everyone else didn't add it. 
why did I add it? Maybe I should go back and double check. And when you go back and double check, you realize, ah, there was clearly an error here. I did not enforce scarcity in the system correctly. And so it's a form of social consensus by technology that has really made this fundamentally a valuable development. I'm curious, uh, and I know we're going to get to to the application or a definition of, of cryptocurrency in this too, but I, I just wanted to put a marker in. <laughs> I'm curious how this applies to privacy and consent. And, and then I, I know we'll be coming back to Sina on that, but this is very exciting what you're describing. Um, so, yeah. you know, as David said, w- with respect to payments and crypto, I mean, talk to us a little bit about that definition. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, in this model that people are using, everyone's keeping a copy of their entries, right? And a few years ago, or actually almost, almost, a, almost a decade now, um, a lot of researchers who are studying these new systems realize, wait a second, if everyone's keeping a copy of this ledger, doesn't everyone get to see everybody's like balances then? <laughs> um, yeah. And that, that's the fundamental flaw in that. So its core strength was also its, its core weakness. Um, and they said, how can we remedy that? Um, what if you could, and, and this was the observation that was made a few years ago, was to say, what if you could um, encrypt all of those values and attest to the correctness of the value that's being encrypted. And so over, almost overnight, what happened was this realization that we can use new forms of cryptography to effectively, for every one of these entries in the ledger, first give a proof that the balance that's being transferred is correct, and then store an encrypted value for that balance uh, next to that attestation, that proof. And that, that effectively spawned this whole new line of thinking of saying, we can offer privacy for people um, when they are making payments in a system like this. And so um, that's where you see a lot of these new privacy coins that have emerged over the past few years um, come about. They're using a form of this type of encryption to allow for everyone to still transact as they would on Bitcoin, but without having everyone be able to see each other's balances. And and I think fundamentally that that's a huge uh, value proposition to make because, I mean, imagine if you you log into you know your your, your Chase Bank or Bank of America or whoever you use um, for, for normal banking. You log in, and it turns out that everyone else has already logged into your account to see what you have. Like that that just feels a little bit odd. It's also a <laughs> violation of a lot of banking privacy laws. And so um, from that perspective, to use this for actual real world payments, you really do need to provide some level of assurance or guarantee that can be offered for um, the actual user. And then on the other side of it. Um, with regards to regulation and regulators, you know, one of the things that people have also started to realize is that in order to use these types of systems um, responsibly, you know, there needs to be a view key or an audit key that allows for a third party to effectively witness what's in that account, but not be able to spend the actual balances in that account. And, and that that's something that most of these new privacy coin systems actually provide now that you can you can look into the accounts, you can give this, this like view key to, to an auditor, they can look at those accounts to make sure that they add up correctly, that the people you're transacting with are correct, um, are, are valid, they're not, they're not uh, on some, some sanctioned list, um, and, and effectively <laughs> actually give a strong assurance to other parties that, hey, like I'm, I'm transacting responsibly here. This is fascinating, and I think one of the things I just was going to and thinking about as you were talking, Howard, is how important is is it for the personal information to even be encrypted and on the ledger or is it possible and i've heard of certain models where the the personal information is actually on separate you know disaggregated databases and you've got the chain the blockchain like pinging back to confirm that those accounts are accurate or you know the information is accurate without having to actually have on the chain itself the personal information, even, even, even as encrypted as you say. Yeah, absolutely. So that this actually hits on a really interesting point, which is um, blockchains have a fundamentally a scalability issue. Um, if you're asking everyone on the system to keep a copy of the entire ledger, um, one of the challenges is that not everyone will be able to keep a copy of that. So you want to construct a solution that lets every as many people participate as possible. And one of the things that people have come to realize is you don't have to put everything on a blockchain. You can effectively use things like hash functions, which which uh, effectively checkpoint the actual state of data you have. 
um, and mm -hmm. store the actual hash on chain. It's a digest of that information on chain without actually mm -hmm. having to store the actual information on chain. So something that could be, let's say, a gigabyte file could now be condensed down into 32 bytes, like this tiny mm -hmm. single string. You know, it's like it's like 40 characters worth of data that you would then mm -hmm. persist on a blockchain and tell everybody, hey, that's the point of reference for you know where, where I'm at right now. Um, and if you can do that, then it allows for these solutions to actually take you in very different directions. Like for a lot of real world enterprises, one of the one of the challenges they have are growing pains. And it's no different from the growing pains that blockchains have, which is you accumulate so much data and you, you don't you don't quite know how you're going to actually scale in the long term because you have so many you know parties involved you have so much responsibility um, and so one way that people actually um, enable this is it, it, to, to use blockchains to ensure those checkpointing uh, is to effectively hash their data and then store that on chain how does you know you talked about the privacy problem that you had been thinking about separately and trying to solve was that synergistic with what Howard is just talking about was were, were you thinking about the same problems I was just curious before you guys met up yeah it's 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 fully synergistic I mean I think the original sin of web 2.0 was just a lack of consent you know people got online they didn't know that everything they were doing is functionally being monitored and entire business models were built on the back of this information asymmetry and this lack of consent now what Howard is talking about is Actually, so much of that in information that's inadvertently shared doesn't need to be shared. We now have methods devised by computer scientists who have been working on this for decades to prove that certain facts are true. For example, my bank account has sufficient funds in it without sharing too much information or more information than I as a consumer would like to share. So think about, for example, the number of times you share your social security number and expose yourself to whoever is holding it. What Howard is saying is we're building the technology to be able to show that you have a social security number and it works, but we don't have to actually share it with that third party. They can be satisfied with the cryptographic proof. Uh, I think that's very, very powerful because it just means that the amount of times we put our information out there can be limited. Yeah, and it just you can see so many different use cases for this in terms of you know identity information, uh, it, government IDs, passports, accounts. I mean, it, it, there's so many different directions this can go in. How is how has the perception been about crypto and and blockchain for the privacy use case? How is, how is the reception for that in the marketplace, I guess, in terms of like our banks and, you know, buying into this model, retailers, et cetera. I'm just curious, like who would be the, the customer that you guys would go after in a Leo? Yeah, I think um, I, I'll, I'll jump in and then would love to get Sina's uh, take on it too. Um, you know, right now where we're currently at, the web is fundamentally broken. Um, there is a very strong asymmetry of information ownership where uh, web services primarily own your data and users have very little say, control, or access to that data. Um, I think that model fundamentally needs to be inverted uh, because um, the web will not continue to scale in this manner and more so as more real-world activities and real-world business actually transacts over the web, it will become necessary to make that, uh, make that switch so that users take back ownership of their data. Now, the first iteration on that has not been impressive in the sense that you know there it's been phenomenal that we have these new um, these new policies like GDPR or CCPA in California um, that actually enable um, users to not only access and inspect that data but actually um, request for that data to be deleted. Um, however. Um, as you can probably imagine or see from your own experience on using the web, when you go to different websites now, every time you, you load up and you click on a Google result, there, you get this giant banner saying, <laughs> you know, we care about your privacy. You need to select, you know, accept cookies yeah. or, you know, <laughs> go through the options. And at some point, 
you know, consumers become numb to that because you, you know, we all use the web all day long now for to do everything. And as you're going from website to website, constantly being hit by this this banner and and this banner in different forms, and some are super convoluted because some are opt in by default for all the cookies, whereas others are opt out by default. And yep. you have to read and you have to click the buttons right. to toggle to like uncheck stuff. You know, it, it's <laughs> yeah. it's different UIs. There, there's no standards, and and it gets it just gets really annoying right and so i think that fundamentally you know everyone's head is starting to go in the right place um and it's a matter of actually iterating on how you build that solution and architect it to make it something that is incentive aligned with the user um that's the part that i think fundamentally we're missing at the moment and and let me give one example to illustrate um you know we talk a lot about data breaches in the news um we talk a lot about passwords being being stolen and lost uh, and um you know, it, it almost calls out or points out that we have a fundamental flaw in how we do authentication um, in, in, in these services. And um, imagine instead of actually when you create a new account, sending your password to the server, the server then, you know, if they're responsible, hashing it correctly, salting it correctly, and then storing it in a database correctly. Um, imagine if you actually didn't have to trust them to do all those complicated steps for you, and rather you did it yourself on the browser side but then provided a proof that the digest that they're actually storing in the database, the hash that they're going to use to compare the next time you log in with is actually the only thing you hand to the service provider. In that case, then they'd actually never have exposure to your password. They only get exposure to this hash of your password. And based on cryptography, there's, there's this property of one-way functions that's or one-way hash functions that says like, unless you actually know the password, you shouldn't from that hash be able to get back or derive back what your password was. And so by giving just the hash over to the server, it actually gives almost an implicit handshake between you as the user and them as the, as the service provider that I'm not going to give you this sensitive data, but I will give you something you can use to reference to prove that I am who I am the next time I come back. Now, you mentioned something uh, for the audience that I think would be helpful to explain. You talked about salt. So, uh, of course, there's all kinds of hashes out there, SHA-256, SHA-1, that are reversible. But you mentioned salt, and I think that's such an intriguing concept of adding that bit of code. But you can explain it as a mathematician and and a technologist much better than I will. So I'd love for you to explain salting and what that means uh, to a hash. So the responsible thing for for service providers to do is uh, to store just a hash of a password in a database. Um, And so in that by doing that, they're not storing the password itself. The hash, though, itself needs to be constructed correctly in that um, if you just hashed a password, um, it could lead you into it could make you vulnerable to what's called a dictionary attack. And so before I get too complicated on this, let me just call out what the human problem is, which is that humans are really bad at creating entropy. So when you ask a user to actually write up or create a new password, they're probably going to put something like password or put like one, two, three, four, (laughs) five, or put like, you know, QWERTY, because whatever is easy, convenient, accessible is likely what they're going to use as their password. And there's also this other issue that humans, you know, are really bad at memorizing and remembering a lot of things. And so, you know, we tend to ha- we tend to reuse passwords on different websites as well. Um, and so, you know, the, the problem with that is one, if you're using a password that's really easy to guess, it doesn't matter whether you hashed it on the server side or not, because um, what a lot of attackers will do is when they actually breach a database, they have this giant list of all these different users and their hashes, and they'll just brute force it by trying all the most common passwords, and they'll keep these in a lookup table to cross-reference and see, hey, like, is this a hash that I've seen before? If so, well, I already know, you know, I already know this, this uh, user's password. I don't need to try and use any, any compute uh, resources to try to figure out their password. I can just guess it because you know, it's such a common one. Like password is so, so common, um, and, and that's, that's a vulnerability. The other side of that is you know, with password reuse, the problem is that if you get breached on one service provider and then another service provider later gets breached, you basically just implicitly got breached at another website as well. And so it's important to one, um, you know, actually come up with complicated or, 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 or long, long passwords that are that are unique and hard to guess. And then two, not to reuse that 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 hard to guess and, and unique password. And this was where a lot of um, sec- uh, security researchers are actually starting to advise people uh, not to think about it as a password. Like, uh, you know, you, you see on a lot of websites that there's 
a requirement for you know some number of digits, some number of characters, uppercase, lowercase, add a sim. That's too complicated. And a lot of security researchers are starting to realize for, for most people, it's easier to remember a passphrase, to remember a long sequence of words. Um, because if you can remember a sentence, you know, and you just keep that sentence as your point of reference, it will be very computationally hard to break that if it's unique. Um, so that's a that's a common piece of uh, of advice that's starting to, to starting to to transcend or starting to become disseminated out there. Um, but um, you know, I'd say more broadly that this solution is still a band aid, um, and it's more so that asking you asking the user to have to do that is really calling out a more systemic flaw in the solution that's been architected, which is to say that the fact that the service provider cannot correctly enforce these things and cannot provide a high level of guarantee um, for their user's security is it's a it's a risk it's a risk to the actual security of what you're offering um, so if you're a bank or if you're a, a hospital or if you're you know a, a stock exchange you should have an actual uh, uh, guarantee a cryptographic a mathematical guarantee that up until this level of security um, we cannot be compromised. And, and that's where these new models where you're actually incentive aligned with the user because um, the server never has to learn your password actually provides a stronger guarantee than what's currently available on the web today. Very fascinating. And thank you for clarifying that um, because I, I think it's something that is is so important. Um, we We keep, I think I just read yesterday about another data breach uh, that was out there um, involving passwords. We have data breaches from 2019 that uh, the hackers are coming back out and reselling that data and it becomes new and fresh, a fresh violation. So if everybody just sort of, even what it, how do you view the, the data breach landscape if, if people start using blockchain and, and crypto technology to effectuate privacy protocols? Yeah, I think the first thing that we're going to see is, um, well, one, a much safer web ecosystem, um, not only for payments, but for any type of personal data that you have to be able to prove the information that's requisite to use a service without having to give away that information um, provides a huge contrast to what we have on the web today. Um, instead of, um, for example, having, um, you know, a, let's say a fitness app have to know the exact precise details of when you're standing, when you're sitting, when you're walking, what your heart rate is, um, you know, what your oxygen level is, maybe what your blood pressure is, um, and potentially leak that and have that get out there and, uh, you know, become a, a, another indicator for, uh, for another company down, downstream um, to provide just the level of information that's necessary to provide a reasonable service um, and to be able to potentially even do that without giving any information at all, I think is, um, you know, where one technology should be heading, um, but then two also, it's almost going to become, in my opinion, a necessity from a regulatory standpoint, because um, for compliance, you're going to need to provide a level of, uh, of guarantee, not only for um, what level of service you provide, but how you provide it. Um, and you want to ensure a certain level of fairness with that service that you provide that I'm not, uh, that no, no single demographic, for example, is being discriminated against. Um, and that's something that is really hard to provide an assurance on today, because we don't have a form of what, at least what, what we call verifiable computation. Um, I can't verifiably uh, demonstrate that the way I computed this thing was you know, done in, in a certain manner. But what this new technology, zero-knowledge proofs effectively lets you do is to actually give an attestation that um, you know, I'm computing blah, using blah information on you know, said logic. And by doing that, you can actually demonstrate not only to the user, but even in court, that I'm only using this algorithm, and this result is clearly from this algorithm. I, I got to ask a question about about you know, your phrase about the asymmetry of information, and the, the ace, which is a great phrase, and, and and it does capture a lot. And and but w what do you do with all these businesses that have been built on this model of the asymmetry? Where I mean, not only your personal information, but your search history. I mean, all kinds of things that are that you wouldn't even think to classify or try to try to try to keep private how do you how do you address companies that have built business models on that and how do you how do you keep that private that's a great question um first off um i think with most of the companies that are out there with data today um only a handful are going to make the full transition and disruption is honestly the strongest catalyst to make people 
actually migrate. So I think that when new companies and new technologies will emerge that are a better solution than what we currently have today, users will naturally gravitate to that. And as part of that process, there exists a forcing function then that actually makes existing companies um, also make the transition. You know, that's that's usually the biggest incentive to make a company uh, evolve. Um, and, you know, I think separate to that, regulation will certainly play a huge factor in this. I, I think within the AI space, we're already seeing that um, today, that there is already a lot of discussion about, you know, who should be owning that data, where should it reside, when should it be accessible, and how can it be used? Um, those are all things that, you know, a lot of courts uh, in different jurisdictions are currently discussing. Um, and uh, I think that with where um, the technology is, uh, it, it, it'll take a little while for it to catch up to, to the intentions, but um, that when we start to reach those points that the technology becomes deployed, um, almost all these companies will, one, have to use a service provider to make that switch. Um, and, and those service providers will almost certainly need to use new forms of, of cryptography to enforce those things. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Well, you know, we have our CCPA has a, you know, it has a standard if there's a, if there's a we, what we call or what the statute calls an exfiltration that you have to have reasonable security precautions. I mean, you guys are going to make that life very, very difficult for people to prove that they've maintained reasonable security precautions, right? I, I think that's <laughs> right. Yeah. I think the current regulations, as we develop our technology, are, are, are going to require something like what we're doing because the premise, again, of how these companies built their business was on everyone else's ignorance. So they just said, hey, look, this is how it works. The data is there. You know, we're just going to look at what's publicly available. But this technology allows a much more limited data share. Uh, and so their business models no longer become like the only option. Um, and fundamentally, what this will be about is, is combination of both regulation and consumer choice. Um, how much consumers want uh, the data and security that, that comes with Web 2.0. I mean, we've become numb to it almost, but this is an enormous problem in our society. Just from 2009 to 2020, the Department of Health and Human Services reports over 200 million healthcare records have been breached. It's enormous. I mean, the volume, like when you look at Equifax, the 2017 FTC uh, settlement, that, that compromised over 147 million people. You know, at this rate, there's going to be absolutely nothing left for anyone to be looking for because all of people's records will be will be public. So, uh, you know, I, I think if you look at that, there, there needs to be a solution. And one of the things I find compelling about this is that it's actually a technological solution that pr provides a lot more data security um, than any than anything that came before it. It's interesting what you say, Sina, because it reminds me of something that I don't know if you've and maybe you've read it, but um, the presidential, I guess it's PCAS, it's like Presidential Committee on Advisory and Science and Technology during President Obama's administration had created a report on big data in 2015. And it talked about this sort of world in the future where an individual could set their privacy settings such that uh, they could wake up in the, you know, make a, make a flight arrangement and, and a driverless car would come the night before, pick up the bags, take it to the airport, go through security. The, the person would arrive and just be able to walk through security. There would be no TSA or anything needed because everyone would know if you put your privacy settings that way, where you're going and what the purpose of your trip was. And then, you know, just and ordering food on and on and on. It, and it sort of described this world that was uh, sort of the future. It, I don't know if you've thought about that report, it, but listening to you, it seems like your this privacy setting would allow somebody to be as protective or as open to technology as they choose. It's very similar to this report done way back in 2015. Is that... Yeah, I I, look, I, I, I think that's right. I think that's prescient. I think fundamentally it's about consumer choice. You know, it's like not every house needs to be made of glass. You can make houses that are less transparent. Um, people protect their privacy when they want. They share the information when when they want. Um, it, it's just about creating consent, like real consent as to what data am I sharing with whom? Why are they keeping the data? 
Um, and if there aren't good answers to that, it doesn't really need to be shared. And from a technological perspective, there's a solution to that. One of the things that I also want to bring up or call out is the opposite approach uh, to what we've been discussing, which is to say um, there are a lot of users who who might say or think, you know, I don't really care if these service providers have my data. And to that end, you know, imagine, you know, for, for, for those listeners, like imagine if you could get, get paid um, to actually give that data, that you actually get a rev share of what they're doing with your data as part of this. That's something that does not exist today. It can't exist today because the internet has no easy way to transact money. Um, and that's what these blockchains fundamentally actually let you facilitate for the first time is that there there can be, and these are technically called smart contracts, but there can be contra- uh, contractually binding logic on the system, on the network that says when I hand this data over and it gets used for this specific purpose, that as part of that purpose, if it you know, has, let's say it's a, it's a transaction from one side uh, for this data, for this, for this money that's coming in, that I can split this, you know, 80, 20 or 70, 30, or however you want to do that. (laughs) Um, And that's something that I don't think people in the, in the world of web commerce today are, have thought about, or have even, even contemplated how you do. Um, And once you kind of start thinking about it that way, you're saying, wait a second. So for the people who really are worried about their, their privacy, you have an option and you could actually pay even like, say, a premium, a tax for it. You, you've already seen web services today that, that different types of these variants exist. Like, you know, some people will watch YouTube with ads. Other people will pay $10 a month to get YouTube red so they don't have ads. And uh, ditto here that, that instead, you know, you could actually say, I'll compensate you a bit if you're willing to give that information. But if you don't want to, that option also exists. Maybe it comes at a slight premium. Um, and this way, for the people who are comfortable, you actually could potentially... Um, increase the bottom line or grow the amount of information that, that you have because the information that a user is comfortable with sharing, uh, they're going to share free in, in a free-flowing manner, whereas the information that they're not comfortable sharing, they're not going to. And in the case of that they need to use it to, to use a service, they may pay a premium for it. Well, you're touching on something that is just one of the hottest issues in privacy right now, which is this whole idea. And I mean, you, know, you uh, David and I have discussed it, but it's it, how are I mean, this is kind of what was at the core of the negotiations around the California Privacy Rights Act, which is going to go into effect in January 2023. And we've heard some of this from uh, Andrew Yang also um, calling for a data, you know, sort of data dividend or pay data value. Um, we've heard our California Governor Newsom a couple of years ago floated the idea of a data dividend. And then he kind of backed off. We didn't really hear anything more about it. Um, the CCPA calls for businesses to value data to the business. And, f- you know, most companies in intangible assets, if they're, you know, you kind of can see this in their public filings, there isn't uh, something set aside for data per se. I mean, I've seen, a, I've kind of started combing through some SEC filings recently, and there are a few in there, but for the vast majority, it's just goodwill or intangible assets like IP, not any breaking out of data valuation. So have you thought about, you know, you talked about rev share, um, but is it, could it consume, I mean, there's so much in this, but is, is rev share, let's just go from the consumer standpoint. I've heard some consumer advocates be concerned about payment for data because they're worried that people who are economically disadvantaged, just like we had clinical trials back in the day where people would kind of sign up for some some things because they need the money, that we would just sort of policy-wise making it a situation where those who could afford not to sell data wouldn't, and those who needed a revenue stream would. Are you concerned? What do you think about those concepts? Yeah. Valid, not valid? Oh, they're a hundred percent valid. And and you know, first off, I, I will say with any new uh, concept and any new approach, it's always prone to to you know abuse. That people will always find some way to to, to leverage it to their advantage, right? So, um, you know, I will say that nonetheless, um, with with this technology, with blockchains, it's really providing a new opportunity for businesses to monetize in new manners. And what I mean by that is um, this concept of rev share and these concepts of dividends, like 
while most traditional web commerce companies are not thinking about it or even even have the the, the tools to actually make that a reality, um, a lot of these crypto companies are. Um, and I think that you know even from something as as innocent as a web browser, like, like your internet browser today, um, there's already an example of this. There's there's the Brave browser, which competes against uh, Mozilla Firefox, um, competes with Google Chrome and uh, you know Apple Safari and, and Internet Edge. Um, Brave is a new type of browser that instead of just showing you ads and getting comp and, and and those websites getting compensated when you click through um to uh, to the ad to, to to get some some affiliate and rev share for, for the actual website that hosted the ad you as the user actually get paid to see these ads so you know fr- from that perspective there really are opportunities where you can demonstrate you know demographically speaking you know there is no there there is no difference between um you know a, you know a mobile device a desktop device a, a young person an old person mm-hmm. you know it, it, there is no difference in that that any person can download this browser today for example start using it um and effectively earn earn a revenue from actually seeing ads now i have no affiliations with this whatsoever and i should put that out there but it's <laughs> it's just one example um of like what you could do because of cryptocurrencies now yeah dominic i, I think that's such an important question um and i think it's important to first say, all right, what's the status quo? And the status quo right now is all of that value gets swept away from consumers. Um, and, and much of it, they don't even know that it's happening. They don't know that they're being tracked even when they're not using websites. A lot of consumers don't. Um, the, the other point I would make is that I think a lot of times the victims of data uh, security breaches and and things that happen when you share too much data uh, are exactly those communities. So, you know, two-factor authentication, for example, might require having a cell phone, might require having the knowledge to have two-factor authentication. So the steps you take to protect yourself aren't equally available to everyone. And the other thing, and uh, I think, David, you've brought this up on the show before, but think about like the rogue loan officer considering facts they don't need to consider. So there's a lot of irrelevant information we share with people who have discretion. It's our date of birth, maybe it's maybe it's our skin color, maybe it's it, it's our, our marital status that allows people to make decisions that are irrelevant uh, to the merits of what they're deciding. And we now have ways, uh, we're, we're building ways to actually prove what needs to be proven without sharing too much information that allows that bias to creep in. We had an anthropologist on, what was she, uh, from the Financial Times. She was actually the chief financial editor or something. She was big time, but uh, she had a background in anthropology. But she she described the whole thing in anthropological terms as, as barter. She basically said, hey, listen, what you're doing as a user is you are bartering your information for the services that the that the let's call it a browser or call it whatever, that the, that the website provides and it's an exchange and that's 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 but it, but it, but the point you make Cena is it's it's a barter where you really don't know what you're giving up right I mean you, you're just it's a it's a theoretical barter you know almost but th- that that was one of my questions that's the Dominic sorry to interrupt but the other question is this because I'm I don't know technology as well as I should or I sh- Dominic's gonna throw me off the show next time, but uh, um, but is it is this gonna be like a this is not a bolt on this is something that you got to start from scratch is that right that you guys are developing I mean you're this is you, you you scrap what we have and come up with something new is that pretty much the way it's gonna work? It's a it's a great question. Um, effectively, you could say it's completely new technology but one of the things that we are doing is integrating it into the existing web so within the web world um, technology standards are also constantly iterating and improving um, they're always evolving there's new types of of, of um, you know uh, uh, execution engines that that are running in your browser if you remember 10 years ago you know everyone was using flash player and then everyone said flash player is you know not safe or we got to get rid of this thing and they switched over to html5 and now every time you, you know you watch youtube or play a game it's an html5 these types of standards are constantly evolving and so you know with with uh, the latest iteration there is this area of of the web community called web assembly and the idea is to standardize and to make common what a lot of um uh 
a lot of JavaScript shortcomings have been, uh, which uh, JavaScript uh, uh, for those um, is it's effectively the programming language that the web uses, um, and it has a lot of weird and, and funky behaviors when you start to write code in it, um, and uh, people have then said, why don't we abstract it away into this separate engine that actually any programming language could compile down to. And so now you can start to write web applications in virtually any language, compile it to something that can run in a web browser and use that instead, potentially a safer language. Um, and so, um, you know, by, by tying these types of new technologies into the solution that we are, we are working on, the system that we have built, um, it enables us to plug into the existing Web2 ecosystem while also plugging into new Web3 ecosystems, as, as a lot of crypto people call it. So that's, that's probably one of the biggest uh, points that I think is, is valuable to, to, to kind of make is that like building a new solution in isolation is really hard to get people to actually adopt and integrate with. And rather, you want to bring it to them to where they are today, that um, if you can show them how you can take an existing stack and effectively upgrade it um, into something that is far more secure, actually has incentives aligned with their users and, and can be potentially trustless, um, that provides a very interesting like, like carrot for them to say, maybe we should take a look at this. It makes a lot of sense. And, and just to, to follow through, if, if so if, if your technology were adopted, you know, say, well, you know, it, there will be various degrees, but I mean, data breaches are meaningless, right? They don't occur. Is that, is that pretty much the way it's going to work? Is that, so you won't have ransomware, you won't have data breaches? Is it so, you know, first off, data breaches, uh, I, I will say, will almost certainly uh, be, be a, a problem, you know, for the rest of the time. But, uh, you know, there, there's only there's only three things in life now that are certain, you know, death taxes and data breaches. But um, <laughs> nonetheless, that <laughs> the, 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 the point the, the, the point is that, you know, when you inevitably get breached, uh, you know, the hope is that you will be minimally breached, that that, you know, you will have as little information, you know, that's actually revealed revealed because a service should not need to know all the information that it knows about you today. You know, like uh, if you have every, you know, data point for every step that you took today, like, and, and it landed in the wrong hands, that would seem really creepy. Um, but, you know, for most of these services, they really don't need that amount of granularity. And even more so, even if they do need that granularity, they don't need to hold it on their server. You can keep it on your phone and have your have the service writer give you the hand over the logic in in, your, in the application and have the application on 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 the client side um, run that run that logic on your data. They don't need to have it on a server, but you know more often than not, you see this this interesting dilemma where they end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> so, Howard, quick question, just piggybacking off of what David was saying. Is there a, an education also in the programming community? Because time and time again, we'll see a mobile app that's built off of a software developer kit that is grabbing location data, and the company will say, well, we never, we don't need location data. We had no idea this was being used. Or you know, I'm just thinking of the COVID-19 apps. I, I can't remember. It was one of the Dakotas, north or south, where they had said, this data is not going to be used for anything at all other than the health Purpose, and then it was built off of a Foursquare just for location purposes, the SDK, and was sharing information with the, with the uh, social platform that didn't want it. You know? So like, what can we do to, I'm just thinking out loud, if, if even if there's a, a role for people such as yourselves, Alio or you, know, you or Sina, to, to go into the programming community and train the young program or new programmers like, how to how to build i guess build with minimal design in mind or is that something yeah is that too early no, to start thinking at the programming level that that's you're you're hitting you're hitting exactly at at the spot that we're looking at which is you know we need to get developers to adopt the technology and the best way to get to the to the heart of the developer is through programming languages. They love to explore new opportunities, possibilities, you know, what's hot, what's new, what's interesting. Um, and, you know, we've we've been building out a new programming language called Leo um, with the intention of using it as a web language. Um, the, the goal and the objective of this is to enable applications that are private by default um, and applications that actually run client side rather than server side um, and provide 
what's called a zero knowledge proof, a, a cryptographic proof attesting to the correctness of that program's execution and the type of data that it reasoned about. And so by doing that, what you're doing is allowing an, a web service to basically be become black boxed such that when uh, a user is using that application, the only thing the server can see then is what's coming out of it, but not what's going into it. And by creating that opportunity, um, you're actually then providing a very strong guarantee, not only for the user, but also even the service provider that I'm only seeing certain types of information. And that information uh, can be, because it's code, you can look at it and easily derive what's, what's being spit out, what's, what's coming out of it. Um, and if you can trust that what's going into it um, cannot be seen because of math, then you, you will have a very strong guarantee that an application written in a language like this has a very high assurance of you know data ownership, data control, data security. So yeah, so you guys, if if, if I don't know how many competitors you have, I was trying to think whether your demand is consumer demand driven or by uh, platform driven. But I mean, it, what you guys could do is you could start basically there. There would be a company that, that would advertise and say, you can buy stuff on our site, and we will never have your credit card information. Uh, I guess you need the address if you're delivering it, maybe. Uh, you'll never know, we'll never know what you bought before, and we'll never know what you're thinking about buying, and we'll never know where else you went, and that's it. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's, that's their business model. That, yeah. I would think that you, you, could, you could promote that as a business model, to, but you, you guys tell me, do you have competitors, and is that where, is that where you guys are headed, is to, to, is to basically look at, at those that want to commercialize uh, themselves using your 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 protections as as essentially a way of attracting consumers and yeah no that's a that's a great point and great question um, you know right now uh, there's we're, we're not alone in this certainly there's a lot of researchers and a lot of companies that are exploring the opportunities and also exploring how do you make this type of technology scale so like one of the things that we have been able to do from a research capacity over the past, you know, three to five years, say, um, is enable this type of application to be performant on on small to mid size applications. But for large scale applications, there's still a gap in in compute resources and compute uh, performance to make it very practical. And so that's where you know, for something like payments or for something like simple transactional swaps for for things like like data sharing, data collecting, data analysis, like. Those are all things that you know are fairly reasonable to do. But if you want to go into domains like machine learning or AI, um, writing those types of applications in this today would be very, very slow. Um, and so that's where we're still pushing the boundaries to make this more practical, more, more, more prevalent. Um, but nonetheless, um, you know, in terms of where I think this is is going. Um, for one, you know, web companies are certainly interested um, within the crypt uh, crypto space. People are especially interested. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that all blockchains basically are public. So, you know, there's all these decentralized exchanges. There's all these new types of, of, of dApps that are basically you can see everything. Imagine if if like, you know, you, you have your birthday coming up and you, you know your, sp your, your spouse's uh, wallet address because you transact with them frequently and they go out to buy a gift for you. But you and you can just see their wallet and see, wait, uh, you know, my spouse <laughs> spent, you know, five hundred dollars on something. What's going on? Like you, you'll know what's and, and, and you can see where they spent it you know, you, you immediately kind of start to realize, wait a second, like, uh, maybe there needs to be some type of privacy guards here. So, um, you know, there's certainly a lot of domains where this is becoming uh, more and more relevant now. I, I guess I, I'm just also curious, um, Howard, how you see actual adoption of, of these tools, because, um, and, and also the business case, because, we see a lot of consumers saying they want consumer choice. They want to have choice and with and transparency, which we get loud and clear. I think that's the impetus for these 142 data protection laws across the globe. The question yeah. becomes: so many of them continue to to use the applications for which they have have stated that they would like more privacy. And then, on the other hand, I haven't seen. I mean, there's certain companies that have made privacy by design table stakes and that's and they're marketing with that i'm starting to see articles and and uh i mean uh, tv commercials etc but my question is has anyone tried to codif codify i guess um product to product you know how much privacy has been a differentiator in other words 
has some company actually gained um, customers or success or assets or revenue uh, because of this? Because I think the ad the advertising model is a is a is a five hundred billion dollar global business, if not more. And so that as much as people detest it, you can kind of see how it keeps grinding along. Um, or they say they detest it, it keeps grinding along. But what's the alternative, I mean, for free-to-consumer? I mean, there's got to be a business model to allow the free-to-consumer to work. I think, you know, first off, you're touching on a, on a great point. Um, I think what most companies don't realize right now is the potential opportunity and the potential scale, the growth they can have in not only their revenue and their bottom line, but their ecosystem by allowing users to have data portability. Um, by being able to actually own their assets, take back their take back the their, their control of, of that data, um, you're you're allowing for these types of, of assets to actually move freely through the web and to create new types of economies that could not possibly exist when it's being guarded under lock and key by a single company today. Um, and and you know I think if you look at gaming as one example. Um, People already are, you know, creating these in-game economies today, where you know they're effectively, you know, transacting, you know, swords for shields and you know, like this item for that item, um, and you know, that's already a very clear demonstration that when you create these some type of a sandbox open market, um, naturally people tend to gravitate towards like creating marketplaces out of it, um, and I think that here there's a very similar trend or very similar type of momentum for the broader case that when you allow users to actually own their assets. Naturally, the free flowing um, of those assets actually creates more economic value for everyone in that system than not. Um, and I think that a lot of businesses don't recognize the potential that you can do with that. Granted, the way that you actually get to that point has to be carefully done. It has to be thoughtful. It has to actually you know, work and it has to be something that is true to heart. Um, but when you get through those steps and you get there, I think the opportunity is far greater than what we have today. The economy, you know, as it is today on the web, is amazing. It's it's very much thriving. Um, but nonetheless, I think that we're we're only seeing a small fraction of what that could look like. I think that's the will be the interesting part to help on the very. I think I have a personal view that that things are kind of going in this direction with so much regulation. And with cookies, I, I just saw the recent announcement that some of the deprecation of third-party cookies is being delayed for a couple of years. But I feel like we're on bar- borrowed time with the ad tracking model a little bit. Uh, but but there's got to be something to replace it, right? I mean, it can't be that everything becomes subscription for the equity reasons that we talked about. Not everybody can pay for the web um, and content, but at the same time, we have to do something to incentivize businesses to provide this content for free. And so if it is the rev share and it's more and more people, you know, maybe we need one, or Howard, you need <laughs> one big, one great success story or one one proof sort of co- of concept case, because right now it's sort of hypothetical. But I do, I do think this is an interesting sh- pivoting moment because the tracking model is like, about to go bye bye. It, it already has on the on the Apple platform anyway. Yeah, this is. I I don't mean to go off topic, but Cena, I gotta ask you because yeah, I'm a we're lawyers, you know, right? We're we're not as. But you are so passionate about this asymmetry issue and and privacy and things like that. How how do you go from being a quirk for Chief Justice Roberts to being focusing on the asymmetry of data? That's like a <laughs> kind of a, hard, a funny leap. Well, you know, it's interesting. If if you frame it that way, yeah, it is hard to understand. But I think this, I mean, the core tenet of legal realism is understanding the nexus between people's legal rights and the legal remedies they have. I mean, this is, it goes, as, you'll find it in Blackstone's commentaries. Like I said, obviously, Louis Brandeis wrote an article about it. Um, it's in Marbury versus Madison. I mean, this is foundational American law stuff. And the interesting thing about thinking through a right of privacy again is what's the remedy? How do you, when these like data breaches affecting a hundred million plus people, I mean, you just put Equifax out of business. I mean, what do you do? And I think uh, Larry Lessig, who was one of my mentors in law school, his book Code um, was really eye opening for me because it, it lets you see that the architecture of the internet 
and the way we code things actually has implications for things we have historically called policy interests. Um, and, and so a lot of things that I care about actually intersect with the technology that, that Howard's talking about. Um, and, and, and Dominic, to, to your point, you know, I think when the internet started, and forget about when the internet started, even 15 years ago, people were talking about, I don't understand Google's business model. How are they going to make money? I don't understand Facebook's business model. And then over time, what happened was they had so much data, they could, they could actually do uh, uh, the ad sales. Um, I think right now, it's, it's very hard to predict where Web 3.0 is going to go. And the things we're talking about are infrastructure layer projects. You know, we're talking about technology that allows people to prove facts without sharing the underlying data. Now, to me, it's hard to predict how that's going to be monetized fully. But like Howard's uh, uh, example of Brave Browser is a very interesting one where you actually literally just pay the viewer to view that. Um, the interesting and the other, the other point I would make about Web 2.0 and the ad model is that it's for all the data they have, it's not even all that accurate. I mean, if you Google search one <laughs> odd thing, you're going to see ads that have nothing to do with you for months and months. <laughs> and so it's, it's, a, it's an kind odd of, combination of like not that helpful, but very invasive. <laughs> and it, it is interesting to go look at some of the data brokers like Axiom do have um, in, in the report I put in the chat. Um, they do have like a hyperlink where you can see what your profile was. And I think they had just because I was looking at some like video games and some other things, they had me as like a 14 year old boy or something. It was like completely wrong. <laughs> um, so um, <laughs> I hear what you're saying. I mean, this was a while ago, but, uh, but I had, they had the complete wrong information from a profile standpoint. Well, well we've gone on, but you guys are too cool. I mean, this has been one of the best, this has really been a blowout conversation. And uh, so I really want to thank you so much for, uh, this has just been great, really. So thank you so much. Uh, th thank you. I mean, thank this was you. phenomenal. It's it's fun to be able to talk about the technology, and I hope it also helps to to get people a better insight into just, you know, what, what the web looks like today and what it could look like tomorrow. Really changes the way you think about things. So thank you again. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks so much. This concludes this episode of Decrypted Unscripted. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to get notified of next episode's release. Copyright 2020, Perkins Coie LLP. Thank you for listening.